My name is Ilunga, and uh, I'll be reading uh, today's scripture passage uh, in English and in Swahili. So whenever we'll be reading in Swahili, don't be surprised so you cannot hear anything. So don't, don't say, is this man still reading English or not? It just didn't <laughs> okay, so there, uh, you can turn to page 850 Pew Bibles that you can follow on the screen as well. It's going to be John chapter 18, verse 15 to 18, and we will skip a little bit to 25 to 27. Let's read God's word. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter Peter stood outside at the door, so at the door. So the other disciples, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of these men's disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. Now the servant and the officer had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Let's give it 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, "You also are not one of these. uh, You also are not one of his disciples, are you?" He denied it and said, "I'm not." One of the servants of the high priest relatives of the man who, whose ears Peter had cut off asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied, denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Uh, and Swahili is, Yohanam uh, Takatifu Sura Kuminam Nani, Tutasoma mustari wa kumi na tano mpaka kumi na mnani. Tutaruka mustari wa shirini na tano mpaka shirini na saba. Wakamfuata yesu petro na wanafunzi mwengine. Na wanafunzi na wanafunzi huyo alikuwa amejulikana na kuwani mkuu. Akaingia pamoja na yesu katika behema ya kuwani mkuu. Lakini petro akasimama inje mlangoni. Basi, basi yule mwanafunzi mwingine aliyejulikana na kuwani mkuu akatoka akasema na akasema na mngoja mlango akamleta Petro ndani basi yule kijakazi aliyekuwa mnangoja mlango akamwambia Petro wewe nawe je u mwanafunzi mmoja wapo wa watu wa mtu huyo Nae akasema si mimi na wala watumwa na watumishi walikuwa wakisimama wamefanya moto wa mkaa maana ilikuwa baridi wakawa wakitoka wakikota moto Petro naye alikuwapo pamoja nao anakota moto na Simoni Petro alikuwa akisimama huko anakota moto basi wakamwambia wewe nawe je huu mwanafunzi wake mmoja wapo naye akakana akasema si mimi mtumwa mmoja wapo wa kuani mkuu naye ni jama yake yule aliyekatwa sikio na Petro akasema je mimi sikukuona wewe bustani pamoja naye basi Petro akakana tena na mara akawika jimbi. Thank you for, for that, Ilunga. Sure. And, uh, it's great to have, in a, in a way, the nations represented even here in this room because we all come together to worship the Lord together, right? We're, we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and so we can say, buongiorno. Well, the Italian is not here today. She's, she's come to the second service, but bonjour, there's some uh, French here, hola, where's our Spanish people, uh, jambo, I think is how you say it in Swahili, is that right? Uh, I'm not sure, what other countries do we have? American, yeah, well, hello. <laughs> we got Southern America, hey, how are y'all? 
Um, but I'm sure we have some other countries here too. I, I know Chad, we have some people from Chad. Um, Haiti, how can I forget Haiti? Brazil, Brazil. that's right. There's, so, anything else? Chad, Chad. yep. Yeah. James, yeah, I see you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. So, thank you so much uh, for that. But this time we'll dismiss those who are going to do the sermon as a second language over in the cafe. You can uh, be dismissed as well as the children four, age four to, through kindergarten. Uh, you can go back. I'm not sure who has you today, but there'll be someone there to greet you, I'm sure. Actually, it would have been interesting to have the kids in here to hear the different rooster calls from around the, from around the world because they are different. You know, I don't know how you say a rooster call, but it's you know, cock-a-doodle-doo, right? But in different countries, it just sounds different if you didn't know that. But uh, what about in Togo? Do you know in Togo? No? Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh, okay. We'll have to do that another time. But anyway, it would have been appropriate for today's uh, sermon at any rate. Anyway. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that we do have this privilege to worship you together from so many different nations as we gather together. We do want you to be honored and glorified. And uh, we thank you for our brothers and sisters around the world who are even at this moment or maybe earlier in the day have, have gathered together to participate in, in worshiping our Lord and Savior. What a privilege it is to be a part of your body, the universal church. And so we ask even in this moment that you would be honored and glorified, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would teach us, you would challenge us, and that you would encourage us. In Jesus' name, amen. So What would you do if you were in a situation where you were just surrounded by a bunch of people who were challenging what you believe? That they're being perhaps even a little bit hostile towards you. How would you respond to them? If you're you're like me, and this may be a little confession time, but I kind of envision if I was in that moment, I would have one of those drop the mic moments where I would just be able to answer their objections just in such a way that leaves the people just stunned and amazed at the answer. And, and of course, they would convert to Christ, but everyone would be silent. Is that what, I don't know. Is that just me? Is that you? Well, as legend has it, uh, this is something that happened a little bit to, to Patrick a long time ago. Today is St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Come tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit more about St. Patrick's during, St. Patrick during the, um, the, the game nights. So you don't want to miss that. But, but there is a story that has gone around about Patrick that has this kind of situation in mind. And there's a hill just north of Dublin. It's kind of an unremarkable hill. There's lots of hills in that region. But this one hill is called the Hill of Slain. And if you were to go there today, there's some ancient ruins on top and that are dating back to hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, and it's, it is reported that on that hill, back in 433, obviously A.D., Patrick lit the first Paschal fire, the first Easter fire, and he did that on the Saturday before Easter. You think, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal was that that day was also a a pagan celebration. They they would celebrate the arrival of spring, and of course they want to uh, praise and and worship, I guess you could say, their own gods. And so Patrick uh, just kind of had enough of that. But What you probably should know also, before I go further, is that part of their celebration were lighting fires on all these hills around that area. And so the king had said, no one can light a fire until I've lit my fire. And if you did, you were going to be put to death. Well, like I said, Patrick had enough of it. He was tired of all this paganism, and he wanted to bring the gospel to Ireland. So what did he do? Well, he lit his fire first, and that did not sit well with the king. So he sends a delegation over there to arrest Patrick, 
to bring him back so that he could be put to death. And when the delegation arrives, Patrick preaches the gospel to these men. And one of them in particular converts. He gets saved. And this is a, apparently was an important person for the king, someone that the king trusted a lot. And so it had a huge influence on the king. And so the king relented and allowed Patrick to continue his missionary work in Ireland. And so that it said that, you know, on that day in 433, Patrick lit the light of the gospel in Ireland, a light that has never been put out since. So that's a great moment. That's one of those great, if you will, drop the mic moments that I think we would all like to claim as our own. But reality is a little bit different, isn't it? Reality is when we get into those conversations where we're being challenged about our beliefs and, and, and people don't understand why we believe such crazy things, maybe we kind of back down a little bit. Or we, we give a response, but yet the response is just not satisfactory to the people that we're talking to. They have their own good arguments anyway. They're not quite as amazed at, at our answers as we are. And so we're kind of left there going, I, 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 uh, you know, don't know what to say. So how do we respond in those ways? You know, the worst case scenario is that we just begin to be quiet, right? We just don't say anything. We begin to retreat. We, we begin to try to avoid those confrontations altogether. And the worst of the worst case scenarios is that we just deny Christ. We deny that we are believers like Peter did here in this, these verses that we have read this morning. Have you ever been in a situation at work or at school Similar to that where you've been challenged a little bit and afterwards as you thought about it, you thought, man, I just blew it. I had the opportunity to be a testimony and I blew it. My hope is that this morning we're going to be both challenged and encouraged Challenged and encouraged. Challenged to not buckle under the pressure that we deny Jesus in some way, whatever form that might take, but also encouraged that if we have failed in some way, that failure does not have to define us. There is restoration. And so what I want to do this morning is take a time to, to read through this passage again, but we're going to do it in a devotional way. And what I mean by that, we're just going to read a couple of verses, we'll stop, we'll make some comments, because what I want us to do is to take time to look around the courtyard. That's where this story is taking place. It's, it's in this courtyard of the high priest. So let's take some time, look around the courtyard, see what we can see, see some of the details of what's, what's happening here, and then we're going to take a step back and try to see what we can learn about the testing of our faith. Because that is what's going on here. Peter's faith is being tested. Pastor Benjamin you know, spoke last week that really in this passage we see two trials, right? You get the one trial inside with Jesus and then you get this other trial outside in the courtyard with Peter. And that trial is more informal and it's a testing of his faith. Will he be a true disciple? So let's go through this, look around at the courtyard, and then back up and see what some lessons that we can learn might be. So let's start off by looking at verses 15 and 16 as we begin to look around. Verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So far, so good. Peter is following Jesus. And you remember, you go back to the beginning of chapter 18, he's following Jesus 
from the garden where Jesus has been arrested to the high priest's house where they're taking him. But the other Gospels tell us a little bit of a detail here. They say that Peter was following at a distance. You know, he's not wanting to be noticed. He's kind of wanting to blend in a little bit and kind of hang out in the back of the group. And there probably are a lot of people surrounding Jesus at this moment. We don't know exactly how many people went to arrest Jesus, but it could have been in the hundreds that had gone to arrest Jesus. But suffice it to say, there's a lot of people surrounding uh, Jesus. And don't forget, Peter had just cut somebody's ear off. So he is really, really wanting just to blend in. He's at a distance. He's following. And he gets to the gate and he can't go in. But that's when we learn about this other disciple. This other disciple, and we don't know his identity. I mean, it would be great to know his identity. And lots of work has been done to try to figure out who this disciple could be. Tradition tells us that it's John. Uh, some other possibilities is that it could be uh, Joseph of Arimathea. It could be Nicodemus. But here's the deal. We just don't know and we can't say conclusively who this disciple is. And that's okay. Okay. Sometimes we want to get off on those little side things. and That's not the main point. What's important here is that we learned this disciple was known by the high priest. Apparently pretty well known by this high priest. So he goes in. He goes into the courtyard. He's not questioned at all. Peter, on the other hand, is stuck outside. He can't even get into the courtyard. So, so imagine, if you will, a house with a gate around the front yard, like a fence around the front yard, and Peter is there at the gate. And the, and the, uh, the bouncer, if you will, won't let him in. And so the, uh, this other disciple, because he's well known, he walks over and he speaks to the little girl, a uh, little girl, sorry, the, the girl at the gate uh, and says, hey, I, I know this guy. You can let him in. And so she lets him in. So he's in the courtyard. Let's keep reading. Verse 17. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. And the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. So he's in. And it appears as he's walking through the door, Peter gets his first test. And really, the servant girl here asks, a pretty innocent question. I mean, she's just doing her job to make sure that the right people get in and they don't let in any of the wrong people. And so she simply asks him if he is one of Jesus' disciples. And the way that the question is written in the Greek, a negative answer is expected. Okay, and I think the English translation here is trying to capture this. So you are not one of his, this man's disciples, are you? And the expected answer is no. No, I'm not. And what we need to hear in this question is that this question is not necessarily hostile. She's just asking a question. She's doing her job. I mean, what would have happened had he answered yes? Oh, I mean, obviously we don't know. But maybe, maybe she knew that this other disciple was, in fact, a disciple of Jesus. So maybe she would have said, okay, yeah, go ahead. You know, that's okay. Maybe she didn't know that other disciple was a disciple of Jesus. And so she would have made a scene and called people over. Hey, we got one of those disciples over here. And, and Peter ends up arrested and next to Jesus. We, we, we don't really know. But he goes in. And as he enters, he enters unfamiliar territory. He's entering a courtyard full of people standing around who had just arrested Jesus. And so for him in that moment, the easiest path was just to simply deny that he was a disciple of Jesus. 
I mean, that's what the question expected anyway. She was expecting him to say no. What he didn't realize was that at that moment, as he was walking into the courtyard denying Jesus, he took his first step into the darkness of denial. Well, we see here also that it's a cold night. And so Peter joins the other people, the officers, standing around a fire. And we're told that this is a charcoal fire. Interesting little detail there. It's a word, this, you know, charcoal fire is a word that only shows up twice in the New Testament. Once here, and then the other one happens in chapter 21 that we'll see in a, in a couple of weeks. But it's like John wants us to connect these two stories. Because in our story today, at this charcoal fire, Peter denies Jesus. In the story that we'll see in a few weeks in chapter 21, Peter is restored by Jesus beside a charcoal fire. So I think John perhaps is wanting to, us to connect those two stories. At this point in John's recounting of Peter's denial... There's an interlude. Okay, so we come you know, to, to, to the end of verse 18, and there's a pause in, in Peter's denial story. And we read about the trial of Jesus before Annas. And, and Pastor Benjamin preached on that uh, last week. But I think John's point here is that all of this is happening at the same time. And he wants us to see that. That there's this trial inside, this trial outside. And, and it's all just kind of intermingled of, of, of what's happening. Another thing probably to keep in mind is this trial of Jesus is, is a big deal. I mean, it's the middle of the night and you have these religious leaders showing up at the high priest's house, coming in. You've you, you got a courtyard full of people. you got these servant girls who are starting to kind of get suspicious of Peter. You, it's just, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of commotion. There's a lot going on. So Peter is in the middle of it. This courtyard is a hub of activity. And so after the interlude, we, we'll start reading again in verse 25, and this is what we find. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the uh, servants, one of the other servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. So now we see the second denial. And again, this question as well expects a negative answer. No, I'm not a disciple. That's what it's expecting. It's not necessarily accusatory. However, we got a strong probability here that the suspicion is, is raising up a little bit. People's antenna are starting to kind of go off. We, we, we see in the other gospel accounts that there's a, a lot going on. And actually, the second denial that Peter does is preceded by people saying, hey, wait a minute, you're one of these disciples. You're making a statement. You're one of them. And so this voice that John records here must have risen kind of to the top. And there's just this, this question of, you're not also one of these disciples, are you? And so now under a little bit more pressure, he denies for a second time. And suddenly that, that warm charcoal fire just got blazing hot as he's feeling the heat of those accusations. And so he takes another step into cold darkness of denial. And so this brings us to the final denial. And I'll, I'll point out here that in Luke's account of this, about an hour has passed between the second and third denial. So there's a lot of time here. Not only is there all this commotion and all this movement going on, there's a lot of time that's passing by here. But again, for this final denial, there, there's a question. And essentially the question is, hey, wait a minute. I saw you in the garden. 
I saw you. But notice that this time there's a, there's a positive answer that is expected. This time the question asked, the answer is expected to be yes. Didn't I see you in the garden? Yeah, yeah, I was there. In other words, the gig is up. He has been discovered. They figured out that Peter is one of the disciples. And, and again, the other Gospels help us understand what's going on. And, and, and they tell us that the people began to pick up on his Galilean accent. They're saying, hey, wait a minute. You're Galilean. Surely you're one of them. I and mean, it'd be like someone coming from the south up here and, and speaking with a southern accent. You, you, I mean, you, you notice it. You pick it up right away. And so they're picking this accent up. Hey, wait, you're, that's a Galilean accent. That's where Jesus was doing his ministry. You, you, you're one of the disciples. And in this dim, charcoal light, you've got, it'd be, it would have been hard to see that night. There's not these little nice string lights that we have in our courtyards, right? It's just, it's just dark. This dim light coming up from the, from, the, from the fire. He's trying to figure out, wait a minute. I think I recognize you. Weren't you in the garden tonight? To make matters worse, the person asking the question is none other than the relative of the guy whose ear Peter had just cut off. (laughs) I saw you. I know I saw you. I was standing next to my cousin, whoever it was. I saw you in the garden that night. And John tells us, Peter again denied it. Immediately, the rooster crowed. And as we read those words, I think John wants us to remember that conversation between Peter and Jesus when Jesus told him, hey, tonight... You're going to deny me three times before that rooster crowed. And Peter boldly proclaimed, No, I'm I'm ready to die with you, Jesus. And that bravado just vanishes like an early morning fog. And despite the warmth of that charcoal fire, he is standing in the cold, dark loneliness of denial. He's brought it on himself. So that's our look around the courtyard. There's there's lots happening, but but what do we learn from it? What what can we take away from this? And I I think the big idea is, is pretty simple. And that is the testing of our faith shines a light on our weaknesses. The testing of our faith shines a light on our weaknesses. And it's in those moments of pressure, of of intense situations, that we see the cracks in our faith. And there are two things about the testing of our faith that I think we can pull out of this story. And, And the first one is that the testing can be subtle. This testing of our faith can be subtle. And what we see in this story, the way that, at least the way that John recounts it, is that there is a growth in the intensity of the denials. While the first two questions he is asked uh, certainly could have been asked with a certain level of suspicion, there's still an uncertainty. They don't really know if he's one of the disciples or not. But regardless of how those questions are asked, He was given an easy way out, and he took it. No, I'm not one of those disciples. Maybe he thought at the moment it was really no big deal. What's what's the problem? But clearly, we, we don't know his motives. But what it does teach us is that we really should think about this: how the simplest of denials could damage our testimony. John simply ends his account of Peter's denials with the rooster crowing. That's it. Just the rooster crowed. Period. But in the other Gospels, something interesting happens when that rooster crows. It is at that moment that he remembers what Jesus had said to him. 
he breaks down. And we're told that he weeps bitterly. It is only in that moment that he realizes the gravity of his denials. In other words, up until that moment, I don't think that Peter even realized that he was denying Christ. I don't think he realized it. That rooster did his job that morning. It woke Peter up. It woke him up to a reality that he was doing the very thing that he said he would not do. His faith had been tested and he failed. Do we realize those moments when our faith is being tested I think that being aware and and being alert at at all times will go a long ways in allowing us to be prepared for those moments. I mean, to to remember that the subtleness that the testing of our faith can can take, I I think that does help us to be ready. But, But how might our faith be tested in subtle ways today? We do face these kinds of subtle testings all the time, and and perhaps even more than what we realize. I mean, at work, at school, at family reunions, we're we're being challenged at at all times. What, What do we do when our colleagues are raging against the Christian values that we hold so dear? How do we respond? What do we do when we talk to that person at school who just all of a sudden starts bashing Christianity. And how how do you respond to them? I mean, you just want them to like you. You know, you just want them to think that you're not weird. How do we respond when our job tells us that we have to do certain things to be in compliance with corporate policies that goes against our Christian faith? How do we respond? Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I I am not saying that the only right answer is that you should boldly and aggressively come against these things that these people are saying. Not saying that. And that you should challenge each and every one of their erroneous beliefs. You don't need to try for that drop the mic moment in every situation. I think there, there is a range of possible responses that you could be given on the on the given on any given situation but one thing is for sure we shouldn't just simply give in and deny what we believe ultimately it is about jesus we are trying to help the people we are talking to see jesus we want them to take a step in their faith journey to jesus The testing of our faith can be subtle. Let's be awake. Let's be prepared. But the second thing I think we can pull out of this story about the testing of our faith is this. We are not as strong as what we think we are. We are not as strong as what we think we are. When that rooster crowed, Peter had a rude awakening, and he remembered those words of Jesus. Jesus had told him that he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. And and again, if you remember that conversation, Peter was saying things like this. I will lay down my life for you. I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Even though they all fall away, talking about the other disciples, I will not. If I must die with you, I will will not deny you. This is a pretty humbling experience for Peter. Pretty humbling experience. I mean, in in some ways, Peter does have a good start. I mean, he does follow. The others ran away. And he follows right into the courtyard. That courage and that boldness just melts away. 
As we watch what is going on in the courtyard and this colossal failure by Peter, this, this sin by Peter, let's call it what it is, John directs our attention to what is happening inside the house with Jesus. And I really do have to think that this is intentional on John's part. Remember, he, he's dividing these, these denials, right? you got the first denial, then what's happening inside with Jesus, and then the other two denials. And in that trial, there is one who does not back down. There is one who does not stick his head in the sand. There is one who confronts the lies with truth. Because he is the truth. There is one who remains faithful through it all. And he will always remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. So we're, we're invited to look at what's happening with Peter and the testing of his faith. And then to look up and look to Jesus, the author of and finisher of our faith. We're, we're not as strong as what we think, but He is. We're not as strong as what we think, and that's okay. He will not fail. We find our strength in Him. Our faith is in Him, the one who is faithful. The one who will perfect our faith. Look to Jesus. That's where you're going to find your true strength. The testing of our faith can be subtle. And if we want to pass the test, we must find our strength in Jesus and not in ourselves. We're going to let ourselves down. We'll let ourselves down. But Jesus won't. The encouraging part of this story of Peter's denial is that it's incomplete. It's incomplete. We've only looked at one portion of it. The story doesn't end here. Peter is restored. And we'll see this when we get to chapter 21 and consider that conversation between Jesus and Peter around that second charcoal fire. But for now, just know that Peter is restored. He, he will actually go on to have his drop the mic Patrick kind of moment. He's going to preach the gospel for the first time and 3,000 people are going to come to know Jesus. He is going to go on a trial himself before the religious leaders. And he is going to unwavering, unwaveringly give a solid testimony for Jesus. You know, this, the testing of our faith re reveals the, the weaknesses of our faith, but it also proves to strengthen our faith in the long run. And that's what we see with Peter. So how might the Spirit be convicting you this morning? Maybe there's some arrogance. Maybe you think you're stronger than what you think, than what you really are. Maybe you need to confess that. Pride comes before the fall. Maybe you've been denying Jesus in some way. And I think that can look a lot of different ways. This is just an outright denial, but sometimes that denial happens in very subtle ways too. Sometimes we say that we believe, but the way that we live our lives contradicts that. That is a, a form of denial itself. So how might the Spirit be convicting you about this? But... But how might the Spirit be encouraging you? Maybe you have blown it. The Spirit wants to restore you as well. The Spirit, want, the Spirit wants to change you, transform you more into the image of Jesus to give a bold testimony for Him, unwavering. That's what He wants to do with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you, you are doing a work in us, that you will complete it. We, 
we're not perfect. We're, we're not strong in and of ourselves, but you are. So we can look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. You'll do the work in us. So we thank you for that. I pray that you would encourage our hearts even this week, that we would be ready for those moments to give a testimony for you, that we wouldn't waver, but that we would be bold in you, courageous in you, stand up for you. In Jesus' name, amen.